Thank you for joining us uh, for the 21st annual Aaron Woldowski Forum uh, on Public Policy. Um, Aaron Woldowski uh, was a leading political scientist of, scientist of his generation, and he was the founding dean of the Golden School of Public Policy. And uh, Aaron Woldowski was uh, committed to using rigorous social science, and in particular, in his case, political science, um, bringing it to bear on public policy as a founding dean. That was a big uh, ethos that he inculcated into the school. I would say one, one signature aspect of the way uh, Aaron Waldowski thought about the relationship between social science and political science and public policy is that in addition to the very important work of bringing social science to bear on solving specific policy problems. That's important work, and that's a great deal of what the Goldman School is about. But he was also interested in bringing social science and political science to bear on bigger public policy questions, bigger questions about the relationship between um, governance and public policy. Um, this uh, lecture series was created at the Goldman School, then GSPP, um, in his memory. So it's a living memorial uh, to Aaron Woldowski and a living memorial to his commitment to the rigorous use of social science to study public policy. There's a book uh, series associated with this, um, the Aaron Woldowski uh, Forum book series that UC Berkeley Press publishes. So each lecture that's given is given with the goal of developing it um, into, a, into a book. The three most recent uh, contributions on the series are uh, David Cutler's The Quality Cure and How Focusing on Healthcare Quality Can Save Your Life and Lower Spending Too. Um, a new edition of Robert Frank's Falling Behind, How Rising Inequality Harms the Middle Class, um, and Rebecca Blank's Changing Inequality. So the discussion of this uh, lecture uh, tonight and the discussion that's going to continue tomorrow uh, morning at the Goldman School. I'm going to mention something about that in a moment. That discussion is giving some feedback and some engagement with ideas uh, with an eye to them being developed into, into, the book, into a book that's going to be added to the series. Let me make a few quick announcements. Um, first, there are blue cards in your program. Uh, if you have any questions in the course of uh, the lecture, we ask that you jot them down on the card, and uh, somebody's going to come around and throughout the lecture give you the opportunity to hand the cards in. I'm, I'm then going to get all the cards at the end uh, and have them to pose questions to, uh, to Professor Pearson. Uh, second, this discussion will continue tomorrow, um, and the discussion tomorrow at the Goldman School is from 9 to 11, and there's a light breakfast at 8.30, so if you get there at 8.30, you can have breakfast. Um, at that event, um, we have three uh, distinguished panelists uh, who are going to give reactions to tonight's lecture. Uh, Professor Terry Moe of Stanford's Political Science Department and of the Hoover Institution will be with us. Uh, Bob Reich, our very own Bob Reich of the Goldman School, uh, will be a panelist. And Margaret Weir, Professor Margaret Weir of both political science and uh, sociology will be on the panel. And at that event, <coughs> they'll offer reflections, uh, challenges, thoughts, uh, and uh, Professor Pearson will have a chance to respond, uh, and, then the, and then the floor will be opened up and we hope to have a, a fulsome discussion. Uh, third, after the lecture, there'll be some light refreshments outside the door. Um, and a couple of things. I want to thank uh, Sandy Catchpaul for doing all the, the pain, uh, difficult work, the logistics of making this whole evening happen. Uh, she did all of it. I didn't do any of it, and I apologize for that. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, Professor Lee Friedman. Where's Lee? Okay, so I said this was the 21st annual Wildowski lecture. I want to acknowledge Professor Lee Friedman and thank him on, on behalf of the Goldman School for having organized the lecture for, uh, for the first 20. And he said, at 20, he said, that's a 20 is enough. It's an even number. Um, I'm done. But he deserves enormous credit uh, for all the work he's done over the years in building the series and being editor of the uh, building the lecture series and being editor of the book series. And the school is deeply uh, in his debt for that. It, 
I've seen um, him introduce uh, speakers before, and I know that if he were here right now, he would tell you to make sure that your cell phones are turned off. Um, and uh, he never, that's something he never forgot to tell people once they invented cell phones. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction uh, to our speaker, Professor Paul Pearson. Uh, I'm going to keep it brief because of the fact that we have just an hour and a half. Um, we're already into it, uh, and we want to leave some time for question and answer after. Um, Professor Pearson is the John Gross Professor of Political Science here at UC Berkeley. Um, he was the Harold Hitchings Burbank Professor of Political Economy at Harvard before that, where he taught for 15 years uh, in the government department. Professor Pearson's scholarship ranges over the areas of political economy, uh, public policy, uh, the welfare state, and American political development, much of it focused on American uh, politics in recent years, but also from a comparative perspective. Um, Professor Pearson's written five books and more articles than I felt like counting when I was preparing my remarks uh, today. Uh, the two most recent books are uh, American Amnesia, Recovering the Forgotten Sources of Our Shared Prosperity, um, and Winner Take All Politics, How Washington Made the Rich Richer and Turned Its Back on the Middle Class both um, co-authored with Jacob Hacker. The, the creativity and impact of Professor Pearson's work has been deservedly recognized. Uh, he's won various prizes of great distinction, uh, such as being a Guggenheim Fellow and receiving prizes from the American Political Science Association for things like the best book in uh, national public policy, the best article published in the American Political Science Review. But dis notwithstanding those distinctions, I think that his greatest distinction is the receipt of the Aaron Woldovsky Enduring Contribution Award uh, from the Public Policy Section of the American Political Science Association. It's fitting that Professor Pearson <clears throat> would win the Aaron Woldovsky Award and would be invited to give the Aaron Woldovsky Lecture uh, because he follows Aaron Woldovsky in many ways and being a preeminent political scientist who is unique in doggedly focusing his attention on broad, important issues of public policy uh, and its relationship to governance. Um, <clears throat> he's also unique in political science, and not entirely unique, but uh, not among the majority, in the, in the extent to which his work, both his scholarship and his commentary, um, engage issues, try, seek, and succeed at engaging issues of public policy in the United States beyond the, the halls of academic political science or beyond the halls of any academic discipline seeking to engage in, in, in public discourse. Uh, I think many people in public policy schools believe that there should be more people in political science departments who have that, have that as part of their agenda. Uh, today, he'll be talking about studying power in contemporary American politics. Paul? Thanks, Sean. Um, and uh, I want to start just by, by thanking Sandy, uh, who, yes, she did it all, um, getting, getting this ready, making it happen. Um, and I want to also thank the commentators who have already taken the time to, to read through the uh, paper that this lecture is based on, uh, and uh, we'll be participating in the discussion tomorrow. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to it hearing your reactions and talking through these, these um, big, you know, I think ultimately kind of intractable uh, questions. Um, it's an honor to, to speak at a lecture that's named for Aaron Woldowski. Um, I do think uh, it's an appropriate forum for, for what I want to talk about for, for a couple of reasons. One is um, that Aaron's uh, first book was actually literally about power. Um, and I'm actually using literally appropriately, which is uncommon these days, but because it, it was literally about uh, the Dixon Yates uh, pro project that um, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority was trying to pass. And uh, you know, so, so it's uh, appropriate uh, to be talking about power here tonight. Um, and it's also, I think, appropriate because, um, as Sean was just saying, and I, and I really agree, I think that um, if you read through uh, 
Aaron Woldowski's incredible scholarship, he was deeply committed to this idea uh, that public policy and uh, political science should be very closely connected. Uh, and I think that has become much less true um, since um, Woldowski's heyday. Uh, and one of the arguments I'm trying to explore tonight is uh, why I think that really thinking seriously about policy and governance and putting that closer to the core of the way that political scientists think about politics and maybe pushing elections and voting a little bit more uh, away from, from the core uh, would actually help us to make progress on some, on some really fundamental issues. Uh, I should also uh, j just mention as, as uh, a part of the introduction, I, the other person I have to thank is, is Jacob Hacker, um, who um, I'm now completing this, the American Amnesia book uh, is not out yet, not finished uh, yet, but it's, it's close and it's the third, third book that we've collaborated on and uh, there certainly um, are places where it's hard for me at this point to remember which ideas were his and which ideas were mine and to separate them out, but, I, but everything that I'm talking about tonight is, is closely connected to the work that we've been, we've been doing together now for 15 years. Um, I've been thinking about this issue of political power and how to, how to study it for even longer, longer than that, really back all the way to my uh, first days in graduate school when I arrived uh, in New Haven in the early 1980s and got an exposure to the debate in that was still uh, going on in political science at that point between pluralists, people who were called pluralists and their critics. Uh, Robert Dahl and Charles Lindblom, who had been leading pluralists, were my teachers. Uh, Robert Dahl was a teacher of Nelson Polsby. Uh, and in addition to Yale, I think it would be fair to say that, uh, that Berkeley was the other major cluster um, of pluralist thought in, in American political science with figures like Aaron Woldowski, Nelson Polsby, uh, and Ray Wolfinger. Um, you know, sadly, uh, most of these figures have passed from the scene now, but I still, I'm gonna, I wanna revisit some of the conversations uh, that were involved uh, uh, in that, that, the arguments about pluralism and the, and the fights between pluralists and their critics, because I think that'll actually help us uh, to, to explore what I see as a fundamental paradox uh, about the nature of power in contemporary American politics. And I'll, I'll talk about that paradox in just a minute. Um, by the time I got to Yale, Dahl and Lindblom had actually defected uh, from the pluralist camp. Let me see if I can figure out how to get to the next slide here. Okay. That's not working. That will do. So uh, in the, in the mid-1970s, um, they had written um, uh, a new introduction to a book that they had published 20 years earlier. Uh, in the earlier book, they had argued, and this became part of the pluralist canon, the basic idea that, that political power, even though that there were inequalities of political resources in the United States, uh, that power was actually very decentralized uh, in the American political system. There were lots of different groups that had access to different parts of the political system, and so while there wasn't, there wasn't what you would consider to be anything like an equal distribution of core resources, nonetheless, power in the system was very highly decentralized. All right, but by 1976, uh, they're writing uh, something quite different, a pretty serious revision, and they would go on to be, I think, even more critical of many of the core ideas of pluralism by the, by the time I showed up there in the mid-1980s. Uh, inequalities with respect to wealth and income, they wrote, are equivalent to inequalities in access to political resources, which in turn foster inequalities in influence. The present distribution of resources in the United States presents a major obstacle to a satisfactory approximation of the goal of political equality. Right? So they're much more concerned at this point about the way in which inequalities in the distribution of social and economic resources can lead uh, to political inequality and inequalities in influence. Uh, and of course, maybe you probably recognize there's an irony to this, right, which is that they were writing in 1976 at the point where actually inequality was at its lowest level in modern American history and it was about to get much, much worse, right? So at the point where they're saying, you know, things actually have to become much more equal, 
if we're going to have anything resembling true political equality, uh, the, the social system is about to move uh, in the other direction. So many of you will have seen by now um, variants. Uh, the slide that I'm going to show you based, this is based on Piketty and Saez's data. Uh, and we're focusing here not on the top 1%. Occupy Wall Street was actually too wishy-washy in their slogan. We really should be talking about the top 10th of 1%. Uh, or the top uh, 100th of 1%. Um, and I just want to put this uh, comparatively. That's, there's Canada. There's uh, Germany. There's Sweden. And there's the United States. Right. Um, so there has been growth in top-end inequality uh, in all these countries, uh, but it's been much more dramatic in the United States uh, than it has been in, in other countries. Uh, you know, and it's striking if you go back to look, to look at this, uh, in the early 1970s, the U.S. in terms of top-end in inequality uh, looked normal uh, within uh, OECD nations. Uh, it doesn't look normal uh, anymore, right? So we know that economic inequality has grown uh, dr dramatically and that that inequality is highly concentrated at the, at the top of the income distribution. Now, just as Don Lindblom anticipated, increasingly, uh, and not really very surprising, increasingly unequal income, economic resources have been translated into political resources. So here's one striking illustration of it. Uh, we could spend a lot of time just talking about money um, in, in elections, uh, but this is looking at the percentage of campaign contributions in federal elections. That are, going, that are coming from the top 10th of 1% of the income distribution. Uh, it was between 10 and 15% at the time when Ronald Reagan uh, came into office, uh, and it's now around 40%. And that is not including dark money, right? That's not including uh, the money that's coming from um, C4s that is almost certainly coming largely uh, from uh, these same uh, very high income groups. But even if you leave that out, uh, you're still talking about now 40%, 40% of federal campaign contributions um, coming um, from one, one individual in 1,000 uh, in, in the American income distribution. Um, most of the conversation, uh, uh, when people talk about the effects of economic inequality in politics, does focus on, on campaigns and electoral politics. Uh, but it's important to recognize that when you look at savvy, organized political actors, uh, they mostly do not devote uh, their big efforts to uh, campaign contributions. Uh, they mostly devote their, their efforts to what broadly could be, uh, can be considered lobbying of some kind. So this is uh, data from Lee Drutman's uh, new book on lobbying. Lee uh, was a graduate student here. Uh, Henry Brady was his dissertation advisor. And you can see whatever year you look at, and there's, there's some fluctuation uh, here, but, uh, but roughly um, uh, corporations are spending um, 12 to 15 times uh, as much money every year on lobbying uh, than they are spending on, on their PAC contributions going to candidates. Um, that's, uh, that's where the action is. And you can see lobbying expenditures in real terms um, have increased uh, dramatically over the last couple of decades. Uh, another way in which you can see this, uh, see some of the transformation in the structure of, of um, political activity, uh, and especially political activity by organized groups, is the increased use of revolving doors. Uh, so these are people registered as Washington lobbyists, and the, the main thing to take out of this slide is that the number of people who are lobbyists who don't have any professional uh, uh, experience in government has actually declined somewhat um, over the last uh, 15 years or so since the kind, this kind of registration has been, been uh, required. Uh, but uh, the amount of lobbying that goes on from people who do have prior political experience, and you know, this graph is, is actually not great for seeing how much the growth of um, me former members of Congress is, but, it, but both other, other uh, members of government and former members of government uh, have become a much, much more prominent part of the lobbying world um, over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, and it's not just uh, that they're increasingly becoming lobbyists, but if you focus on the high-end lobbyists, right, the ones 
who Drutman finds are associated with a uh, million dollars or more of annual uh, revenue to, their, uh, to, to the people employing them. That is, first of all, the number of people who are generating that kind of revenue uh, has increased very dramatically over that period and it is highly concentrated among people who have um, passed through this revolving door from the public sector to the private sector. Um, lobbying, formal lobbying at least by former members of Congress was once almost unheard of. It is now over the last 15 or 20 years has become um, the, occupation, the occupation of choice for people who are retiring uh, from Congress. Uh, so you see um, more and more a tight link what looks like a tight link between experience with the exercise of political power uh, moving over to places that involve um, considerable economic power. Uh, another indicator of this, this is also from uh, Drutman's new book. He, um, he presented something that he calls the countervailing power ratio. And all he's doing is looking at uh, what's the ratio of the amount of money that's being spent by lobbyists associated with business uh, compared with diffuse interest lob lobbying like consumer groups and environmental groups uh, and labor unions. Uh, back in the good old days when that was at the you know, relatively healthy ratio of 22 to 1, right, that's back in, in 1998, uh, now it's up to 34 to 1. Right? So, so lobbying has grown dramatically. Uh, it has also become uh, more lopsided uh, in, the, in, in terms of what the balance is between different kinds of interests. Um, so at least, at least this provides, I think, pretty strong indicator that in terms of political behavior, you see that the increasing inequality of economic resources seems to translate in the way that Don Lindblom talked about into increasing uh, inequality in political resources. Uh, this is something that most voters, even though they have only a vague sense of this, of this kind of data, most voters seem, seem to have a sense that this is going on. If you look at a uh, classic survey question, public opinion question, asking people whether they believe the government was run mostly for the benefit of all the people or mostly run by a few big interests looking after themselves. 50 years ago in 1964, 64 to 29, Americans gave the more optimistic answer about that. In 2012, that had completely reversed. 19% thought run for, the, uh, for most folks, 79% thought run by a few big interests looking after themselves. Um, and an, another you know, kind of crude, non, well, non-formal political science uh, version of this, I think of the, the great uh, Chicago uh, political scientist Rahm Emanuel, uh, who a few years back when he was running the Democratic Congressional Campaign Commission described his approach to campaigns in the following way. He said, you divide your campaign into three parts. Right? Part one is money, money, and money. Right? Part two is money, money, and media. Part three is money, media, and voters. Right? So you count, count the scorecard, it's money six, voters one. Um, and you know, that's, I think, a kind of, if you ask people who are not immersed in political science, as the polling data suggests, that's the way that most Americans think about uh, how American politics works today. Now, the motivation for this talk is that it's not the way the political scientists mostly think about it. So even though political scientists, everything that I've said so far uh, descriptively about what's happened to the political behavior of groups, to campaign spending, lobbying, the revolving door, all accepted by political scientists, what they have not accepted, for the most part, is uh, the idea that that translates into big inequalities in political influence. Right. So there's a paradox. Right. Big increases in economic inequality and inequality in certain kinds of political behavior, not a lot of evidence, solid evidence, according to political scientists, uh, that this generates big inequalities in influence. All right, so just to quickly, very quickly run through some of, this, some of this research, little evidence that campaign contributions systematically affect roll call votes in Congress. Uh, most campaign contributions, and a, a famous article suggested, amount to symbolic participation because they don't have that much effect on election. 
When the business community is unified and involved in a big fight uh, uh, on Capitol Hill, it has a very mediocre record of success. Careful study by uh, Mark Smith at the University of Washington. Um, there's quite a bit of evidence that lobbying buys time, buys face time with politicians, um, and may um, provide important subsidies in some ways, you know, substituting for, say, campaign staff or something like that. Uh, for members of Congress, but there's not much evidence to, that suggests that it actually, again, affects roll call votes in any kind of systematic way. A very careful recent study of lobbying revealed virtually no linkage between group resources and outcomes. No linkage between, you could identify which groups had more resources and how they lined up in a political fight, but that wasn't correlated with what, what ended up happening. Um, as a result of, of their lobbying efforts. Right. So political scientists largely have dissented from what I think is the common, uh, the, the common impression of what's happened to um, the balance of influence in American politics. Um, I want to just mention now, I'll come back to it later, but for people who have been following this discussion, you'll know, you'll, you may be thinking about this already, uh, there recently has been a prominent dissent from the dissenters Right. Marty Gillens, uh, Prince, uh, Princeton, uh, in a, a really important book uh, called Affluence and Influence, uh, has uh, used public opinion research to try to identify what people's policy preferences are in different parts of the income distribution. And essentially what he finds is that if you're a high income person uh, and have uh, particular views on policy, there's some real probability that, you, that, um, that that change in public policy will come about. If you're low income or middle income, it essentially doesn't matter what your views are in terms of, in terms of the likelihood uh, that those changes are going to be adopted. I'm just going to leave, I just wanted to put this up there in, because people may be thinking about it, uh, and I'll come back to it now. But I want to emphasize that I think uh, if one examines the literature among political scientists studying American politics, this is the unusual finding. Um, the, if, you, if you surveyed a group of uh, political scientists studying American politics, the idea that actually money and unequal um, organizational resources don't have that big an effect on, on politics would be the more conventional view. All right. Now, um, so there are two possibilities here. Um, one possibility is that this just means if, if political scientists don't see the effect of economic uh, and political inequality on influence, so much the worse for political science. Uh, or there's a more optimistic view that says maybe we don't have to worry about um, economic inequality so much, at least in terms of its effect on political outcomes. I'm going to suggest um, that the less optimistic answer is probably the right answer, that, and that this reflects more some limitations in the way political scientists have been thinking about these issues. Um, but, um, uh, but it's going to take me a little, a little while to unpack that. Um, most political scientists, and I think this is just, I think, important background for thinking about this, um, have developed a framework really based upon Anthony Downs' uh, uh, work way back from uh, the 1950s um, that doesn't have much, that puts voters at the center, right? Uh, in particular, this last idea I'm going to mention, the idea that the median, got, the median uh, voter is really the person who's going to determine the policy outcomes because that's the person who determines who's going to win the election. Uh, and as a result, um, politicians have to be highly responsive uh, to the, the, view, the views of the median voter. Um, and you know, one thing that I think um, is, the well, reason I call this a power-free uh, perspective is if you think that that's what's driving the policy outcomes, the political outcomes, it really doesn't make much sense to think in terms of power, right? You wouldn't say that one voting block is more powerful than another voting block. You would just say they had more people, right? It's the majority, it's the majority position uh, that's winning. Um, I'm gonna skip, there, there are a lot of reasons why this framework has been appealing to political scientists. It's very data friendly. It's normatively appealing. I think a lot of people think it's nice to have a political system. There's a way in which this is sort of the modern version of pluralism uh, based, on the, based on these kinds of arguments. Voters are sovereign. Politicians have to respond. Uh, in, the, in the words of Anthony Downs, uh, politicians 
enact policies in order to win elections. So they're going to be trying to appeal to those voting blocks, um, and that makes, that makes the voters themselves sovereign. Um, it's worth emphasizing just at the outset what gets left out of this kind of framework, right? That sees really the connection, the electoral connection between voters and politicians is central, doesn't pay very much attention to political parties, doesn't pay very much attention to organized interests. This is a key reason uh, why they're comfortable with the findings that I've been talking about before. You, you can see a lot of lobbying going on. You can see a lot of campaign finance contributions going on. But if politicians have to respond to the electorate in order to win elections, then all that activity doesn't really have that much effect. Right? Um, and then the last point, which I think is quite important, at least for the kind of argument that I want to develop tonight, is this system is very fluid. Right? Policy and politics is going to go to wherever the median voter is. There's a lot of research on public opinion that suggests that voters, they, may, they move a little bit to the left, they move a little bit to the right. If they elect somebody who's more liberal, they may become a little bit more conservative to counteract that. If they elect somebody who's conservative, they become a little bit more liberal. But voters act as kind of a thermostat, keeping the whole system in line. There are no durable victories. Right? You just move from election to election with very modest adjustments. Politics is quite plastic or fluid in this framework. Uh, Jacob and I like to say uh, that it's an image of politics uh, that's like uh, the movie Groundhog Day. Um, uh, Bill Murray, if you remember, he wakes up in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania every morning and goes through his miserable day, and the next morning he wakes up and Sonny and Cher are on the radio, the clock radio again, singing I Got You, Babe, uh, and the whole day just starts over again. Right? You never really go anywhere. Right? You just do the same day over and over again. And that's kind of, that's kind of the view of politics. Um, that comes out of um, this, way, this way of looking at things. Looking at things. Um, I don't think so. Um, I think there's something wrong with the way um, that these scholars are thinking about how political power is exercised. Um, and in order to lay that out, it really involves going back to that original um, debate between pluralists and their critics in which the pluralists argued um, that what you really want to do is focus on open conflict and see who wins in these open conflicts. Um, and their critics, I think, made a number of really powerful arguments about why that was a very limited approach to thinking about political influence. And I need to run through these. Um, uh, I'll try to run through them fairly quickly because they're important. So, so the critics said that's the first dimension of power, like you look at a fight over, say, a roll call vote in Congress, there's open conflict. You can see which side wins uh, and which side loses and come to some judgment based on that. Um, but there are a number of possibilities with drawing conclusions about what the structure of influence looks like just by focusing on that first dimension. All right, so the second dimension, which suggests that often you're not going to see that kind of open conflict, is because of the role of anticipated reactions. All right? If you're involved in some kind of conflict and you mobilize for it, it's costly, right? You have to use resources. If you lose, it could cause damage to your reputation. Probably most important in many contexts, there could be retaliation, right? You could be punished. Um, and so in context, the, the implication of this is um, that in context where there's a lot of inequality in, in uh, political power, social power, uh, you're gonna see quiescence, right? The weaker side is not gonna mobilize. They're not going to waste a, bu a bunch of resources for no purpose. They're not going to uh, make, make themselves look weak. Uh, they're not going to risk retaliation. Right? So if you think about labor relations, you know, do, are people going to launch a, a strike that they know that they're going to lose? Is a slave uh, going to, you know, so you could imagine a situation in which slaves are being quiescent, right? so there's no open conflict. That doesn't mean that there aren't inequalities of power in that kind of situation. So um, anticipated reactions are a really important reason why you might not see, um, even though there's a lot of inequality in power, uh, it might not be manifested in visible con conflict. And in fact, there are con many contexts in modern social sciences, like studying whether a president vetoes legislation or how international bargaining goes on, maybe between a strong country and a weak country that make a lot of use of these ideas of anticipated reactions.
Second possibility, what uh, the critics of pluralists, E.E. E. Schaffsneider famously called the mobilization of bias, which I think really is about agenda control. Right? He wrote that all forms of political organization have a bias in favor of the exploitation of some kinds of conflict and the suppression of others. Some issues are organized into politics while others are organized out. And again, this is a really important idea, I think. How key decision-making structures are designed is crucial. Right? If I was going to participate in my younger days, if I were going to participate in a sports event, right, it would make a big difference whether that event was going to be basketball or track. Right? If I got to control the agenda, I'd want to be playing basketball. Right? And how things were going to turn out would depend a lot on who got to decide what the, what the game was uh, that we were going to play. Right. So there now, again, in parts of the social sciences, there's a lot of good research on this that suggests that these design decisions that are made uh, can have a big effect on who is going to win. Right? Who's going to be able to pursue what kinds of strategies in order to get what they want. So research on central banks like the Federal Reserve, research on the internal structure of Congress, in which, for example, a majority party unless it's the House Republican majority, uh, can keep divisive issues off the agenda um, through the exercise uh, of agenda control. John Boehner's plight would be even worse if he didn't have um, some, of the, some of these possibilities. Right? There's a third dimension. I'm just calling it false consciousness. Um, and I'm not going to talk much about the third dimension in the rest of the talk, not because I think it's unimportant, but because I think there's plenty on our plate without, without uh, trying, to, trying to dive into this. Um, but at least in theory, this was another important critique of pluralism. Influence can involve changing what other people think about the state of the world. Is Obamacare reducing or increasing health care costs? Um, about what is desirable or about what's possible. Right? How we think about all those things matters. And it's at least theoretically possible, and in many contexts I think more than theoretically possible, that influence over the media, advertising, schools, think tanks, other prominent cultural institutions can be a way of influencing what people think in a way that can be to the advantage of some actors over others. And again, that could produce not open conflict, right, um, but some people using influence over others to get what they want. Um, just one very quick, sketchy example, um, because like I said, I'm not going to, um, this is not, um, uh, an issue that I'm going to try to explore more tonight. Uh, you look at the recent economic crisis, right? So a huge increase in unemployment there on the, on the right-hand side beginning in 2009. And on the left-hand side, you have major newspapers and whether they're writing, they're, to the extent to which they're running stories that focus either on jobs or the deficit, right? Red is the deficit, appropriately, I suppose, to have that, to have that in red ink. Right? But you can see, even when the unemployment rate is still really high, right? really, really high, um, the focus is, you know, first of all, there's all, there's all the way through this at least as much attention being paid in these headlines to budget deficits as there is to employment issues. Uh, and then uh, very early on in the entire uh, process of the economic crisis, there's a real shift in focus towards deficit considerations. Um, just putting up uh, very quickly here that there is at least we now, uh, thanks to some work that's been done by Page and Bartels and Seawright, we have at least some uh, preliminary evidence where they're really trying to focus on the, the policy attitudes of the very well-to-do. And I have to say, actually, they've been pretty good at, actually, at getting into the top 1%. But even this um, you know, very unusual and quite impressive survey doesn't penetrate really into the top tenth of one percent of the, and not to the, maybe it gets to the edges of the top tenth of one percent, it doesn't get to the 0.01 percent at all. Those, you know, you just can't, you can't get people like that to answer, to answer surveys. Um, but it does suggest that there's a lot more, uh, that there's a lot less concern about employment, uh, among other things, uh, among the very well-to-do than there is among the mass public. Okay. Uh, 
The upshot of all this, this is from the Swedish sociologist Walter Kor Korpi, and I think it's the core, the core of the implication of everything that I've been saying about the critique of pluralism. Right? The probability of manifest conflicts, of open political conflict, decreases as there are increasing differences in power resources between actors. And because of that, if you focus a study of power on situations that only involve those manifest conflicts, you're going to considerably increase the likelihood of discovering pluralist power structures. Right? By focusing on those visible conflicts, you're really looking at a tiny sliver of the potential conflicts in the society, and you're actually filtering out all the ones that involve really substantial inequalities of, um, of political power. Right? Those all disappear before you get to the manifest conflict. Right? So most of the studies that I was talking about before, they're only examining open conflict on the established agenda. Uh, Smith, the study I was talking about about the Chamber of Commerce, he's not examining all the issues in society on which business is unified, but only the very small subset of issues that actually get onto the political agenda, right? even though business is unified. Right? And if you think about it for a second, that's got to be a pretty weird subset of issues. The study of lobbying that found that there was no inequality, um, uh, that, you know, that, that people who had more resources in lobbying didn't necessarily get what they want. You know, much to their credit, these guys concluded you couldn't draw really big generalizations from that about, uh, about inequality of resources because there was a very good chance that the existing public policy already reflected those inequalities of, of power and resources. So in the same way that economists would say, you know, if you look at this price of a stock at any particular time, it reflects everybody's valuation of the company up, up until that point. So it may fluctuate on a daily basis because of changes that are taking place at the margin. But core considerations, the core balance of considerations about the firm, they're already baked into the stock price. The result of that is we shouldn't expect, and again, like I say, Baumgartner and his colleagues, to their credit, they make this point. We shouldn't necessarily expect that the people with more resources are going to win, given that arguably a lot of their concerns are already built into the, the public policy status quo. All right, so, so these studies that say, economic power, uh, organizational resources don't really matter very much. Um, they're based on certain assumptions that, really st that, that are really closely tied to looking at open, open conflict in a way that we should be suspicious of. Right. Power looks more like this. Right. Most of the time, most of it is submerged. Um, and if you only focus on what's above the surface, like the USS political science is doing there, right? you, may be, you may be running into trouble. So what I suggest in the paper, and I, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail about this now, um, is to suggest that we need to think about an approach to power that is more structural, more historical, more focused on public policy. Um, and a key starting point, starting off point for my analysis about this really draws very heavily on Terry Moe's uh, work, a, a great uh, paper that he wrote 10 years ago in which he pointed out um, that we really needed to understand something fundamental about political institutions that made them very different from economic institutions. He wrote this at a time where many people were taking arguments developed by economists about how to think about institutions that made sense for thinking about market institutions like firms, right? But we're getting translated into politics without really thinking about how politics is different. And Terry's fundamental point was, is, was that what's fundamental in politics is that winners in politics get to exercise authority over losers. They get control of the political apparatus, and in politics, in a market, you can decide to walk away, right? You can exit if you don't like the terms. That's not really true in politics. That's not really true in politics. You have to deal with um, institutions of political authority that can tell you things that you have to do or things that you can't do, or if you're going to do them, you have to do them in a certain way. 
And so because that's true, groups work really hard to try to get control of governance, to set up policies that they think are going to serve their interests, the winner's interests. Right? And this is true of formal political institutions, right? like in a famous recent book, Asimoglu and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, their argument was democracy itself represented a fundamental shift in the balance of social power. Right? Because less advantaged groups were able to enact and sustain new kinds of institutions, shifting from track to basketball, or however, however you want to think about it, right? um, that gave them better opportunities. And a fundamental point, in addition to this, and I think more relevant for thinking about the world we live in now, because we don't get that many big changes in constitutions that often, is that many of these advantages are, are instituted in public policies. If you look at modern governments that are extensively involved and involved in a huge range of, um, of operations, structures of public policy are the mobilization of bias. Right? They favor the pursuit of certain kinds of interests uh, over, over others. I'll just give you quick, a quick a couple, of, couple of examples about this. We often talk about the structure of American federalism. You know, we revere the founders. We talk about it like it was an optimal design problem that you had a bunch of architects in there trying to figure out how to design the perfect building. But a fundamental issue, right, that has affected politics all the way down since then was what was going to be the representation for the states in the federal government, right? And this was a fiercely fought political issue. It almost brought the Constitutional Convention to its knees, right? So small state representative basically saying that if Madison's proposal which would have been for proportional representation in the Senate, right? No rule that says each state gets two votes, right? It's based on population, right? So the populous states, right? Would it, things would have been weighted to their advantage. Representative from a small state says, we would rather, right, join with France or England, right? Than submit to your proposal. Madison lost, right? We often talk about the Constitution as if it was Madison's design. It wasn't Madison's design. Right? On a lot of fundamental issues, including this one, he lost. The winners locked in their victory. Right? It's very difficult to change the American Constitution, but if you read it carefully, you will discover that it is impossible, essentially impossible, to take out, to change the way in which votes in the Senate are allocated among the states permanent institutionalization of advantage, right? power politics. And I don't say that, you know, not a criticism. Right? It's just this was not an optimal design solution. Right? It was a political fight, and one side won. Right? And they won permanently. This is not Groundhog Day. Right? You don't just start over the next day. Right? Policy example, famous policy example, Social Security, you know, working on its 80th birthday. Right. FDR, right, in response to somebody saying, you know, those payroll taxes you're using, they're really cumbersome and there's some economic disadvantages. You really shouldn't be doing that. He says, I guess you're right on the economics. They're politics all the way through. We put those payroll contributions there so as to give the contrib contributors a legal, moral, and political right to collect their pensions and their unemployment benefits. And, and here's the not Groundhog Day part. With those taxes in there, no damn politician can ever scrap my Social Security program. Right. So the mobilization of uh, bias, the institutionalization of advantage. All right. So what I'm suggesting is an alternative way to, think, to approach the study of power, to focus on the construction of major policy regimes, to study multiple rounds in the development of those policy regimes so that you can examine these kinds of processes of, institutional, of institutionalizing advantage, and also methodologically you can gain leverage for assessing competing causal accounts, and you especially have to pay attention to these kind of hidden dynamics, which are often easier to see if you look at multiple rounds, right, um, and, and what happens to different proposals that are trying to fight their way onto the political agenda, issues of anticipated reactions and agenda control. All right, very quick illustration, right? very quick. 
just, just a sketch, all right? U.S. healthcare. Okay. Why U.S. healthcare? Well, it's just a case, and of course, if you only look at one case, most modern social scientists will say, eh, you know, what does this mean? Um, but healthcare at least has the advantage that it's the sixth of the economy, all right? So if the argument makes any sense for healthcare, it's probably worth paying attention. Um, because you can actually look, in this case, in a way I think that's more straightforward, not totally straightforward, but more straightforward than it is with something like uh, finance or uh, um, uh, issues that are a little bit less tr transparent, you can compare it to outcomes in other countries. It makes it a lot easier to assess who is getting what, when, and how uh, in American politics. There's also a ton of, of good historical work, um, and including some really nice work that's already been done in the Affordable Care Act, that helps you to think um, about how to assess what groups are doing, uh, what, they want, what they're trying to do, and why certain kinds of decisions uh, are made. Uh, three big takeaways about healthcare when you, when you go through this exercise. And again, I'm gonna have to do it really quickly. First, the US is a massive outlier in comparative perspective. And I'll say something more about that in a second. Um, we have very high costs. They're primarily driven by high prices paid to healthcare providers. Because we don't, unlike every other country, we don't have very effective countervailing power resting in public authority. Right. Why is that? Because there's been a successful effort waged through sustained applications of political power to prevent those policies. That's, um, now obviously, I'm not gonna be able to prove that tonight. Right. But let's, let's look at each of these. All right, so we know, if you look cross-nationally, that as countries get richer, they spend more per capita on healthcare. Where's the US? There's the US. Oh. We are, so that's expected spending according to wealth, right? You'd expect us to be on the line. That's about $500 billion. And next year it'll be another $500 billion. We're, a massive outlier. Um, primarily because healthcare prices are really high in the US for procedures, right? Um, and I actually did have a slide, there's, I can't remember what, there's, there's, uh, there are huge disparities across the US in what's charged for different kinds of procedures, much more uh, so than other countries. We're at the high end, sometimes way on the high end for virtually everything. There's one uh, high end procedure, I can't remember what it, what it is, in which Alameda County is actually the most expensive place uh, in the country. Um, but, um, but across the board, pretty much, uh, we pay more for the same procedure. Some of you have probably um, read, um, Elizabeth Rosenthal did this long uh, series in the New York Times, quite powerful series in the New York Times. Uh, she focuses on a case um, where somebody needed a hip, was it a hip replacement? Hip replacement, right? Um, and was quoted a price of $78,000, not covered uh, by his insurance. Uh, he decided, uh, and that did not include the surgeon's fees, $78,000 not including the surgeon's fees. Um, he said, well, I can't pay that. Uh, and determined that he could go to Belgium, get the same hip replacement for uh, $13,300, um, including all provider fees, operating room costs, five days in the hospital, week of rehab, and round trip air, airfare. <laughs> right. Right. One sixth uh, of the cost of what's, what was going to be charged in the U.S. Right. So um, there's just there's a lot of research now on how much more we pay um, than everybody than everybody else does. Um, I can't. I feel. I almost feel bad about doing this because I thought the Rosenthal theory was really great. Uh, the, the series that she did was really great. Um, but I have to say there's one indication here, I think, of what I, what I call this, the third dimension of power, false consciousness, or like the inability to think, even, even after you've been studying this issue and writing tellingly about it from a comparative perspective about how crazy American healthcare prices are compared with everybody else. She was on Fresh Air, right? She's talking to Terry Gross, and Terry Gross is trying to push her on this. Like, you know, she's been hearing all these horror stories about how much everything, all, the, all these procedures cost, and, she's, and she finally, you know, she keeps pushing, saying, why, why are the prices so high? And this is what Rosenthal said, I feel bad about this, but, it's, but I do think it's kind of telling, right? 
Uh, and Rosenthal says, I think it's everyone. And it's partly, you know, our expectations in the sense of, wow, we want a private delivery room with good Wi-Fi and great coffee. I don't know what hospital she's getting great coffee at, but uh, I mean, some of these hospitals are competing the way universities compete. You know, we have a great gym, we have room service. I mean, that's not really the essence of healthcare. So I think if that's what we demand, we're really tracking our healthcare dollars in the wrong direction. Right? It's something about we're, we're, we're demanding too much fanciness. But no, the truth, we're, we, are, we are paying way, way more for the same stuff right? in, in most cases. Right? So, um, but even have, after having done all this research, this is, this is where she ends up. So a quick look at the ACA, uh, Obamacare, and where this would fit into this. Jonathan Gruber, well-known political analyst. Um, I'm glad he didn't uh, keep his mouth shut for this one either. Um, because I think it does, and th this is based on uh, Stephen Brill's, I think actually horribly written, but excellent book um, on you know, re really laying out the way in which it is just very, very difficult to take on organized providers uh, in dealing um, with uh, the healthcare system. Uh, and as Gruber put it, you can either try to expand coverage or you can try to do something to control costs. But trying to control costs, in other words, trying to deal with the massive outlying uh, status of the US. If you try to do that, um, that will doom you because the lobbyists will kill you. That's what happened to Hillary uh, in 1993. And so what the, what the White House does, right, it's very clear, right, is they sit down with the major provider groups before legislation is even introduced, right, and they cut deals with them. Right? Um, and they know that the providers actually are going to benefit from increased access, right, because it means bigger markets for them. And the, so they ask for some of that back in order to finance health care reform. Right? Um, but in, 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 in order to make the agreement stick, they have to make the agreement in the interest of the providers. Right? So they promise right, that they are not going to uh, pursue the kinds of policies. Uh, Jacob was interested in the public option as um, one possible contributor. Uh, contribution to that. They're not going to pursue the kinds of policies um, that, would that would really stick to providers, right? So just as one example of that, uh, Brill reports um, the negotiations over what was going to happen with pharmaceuticals with Billy Towson, who had moved through the revolving door out of a Republican Congress to being uh, the head lobbyist for pharma. Um, and when they tried to expand how much money uh, pharma was, uh, pharma was going to drug companies were, were going to provide. Towson didn't budge. He knew they could never get 60 votes in the Senate if the drug makers switched sides and began financing a different set of ads, and he said so. Right. So basically, Pharma said, we have, I think the figure was $70 million or $80 million of ads that we're, we're willing to run, and we can run them on either side. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. And you don't have a lot of margin for error. Right. So those things get drafted out of the legislation uh, in advance. Anticipated reactions are, are at work here, um, producing not open conflict, uh, right, but simply taking a, a set of policy changes off the agenda before you get, before you get any further. All right. I'm going to skip over the discussion of Marty Gillins because I, I want to leave some time for questions. I'm just going skip right to skip right over that. I'd be happy to come back and talk about it. I think. Um, uh, and my guess is that we will talk about this tomorrow uh, in the session if we don't if we don't get to more of it, if we don't get to more of it um, tonight. Um, but um, I think broadly the Gillen story is consistent um, with the outlines of what I'm uh, of what I'm saying. Um, but I think that there are many ways in which actually even his research overestimates how much responsiveness there is um, to ordinary citizens in the political system. Um, so just as an illustration of that. He actually codes a couple of important initiatives in the Bush administration as being responsive to uh, the policy preferences of the mass electorate. Um, the two, most two of the most important policy initiatives of the last 25 years. Uh, one is the Iraq War. Right? And I think there's a strong argument to be made that the Iraq War reflects the third dimension of power, that is, right, that, that people used uh, their, use their political power to create views about the state of the world right, that favored the things that they wanted to do. Right? So it's not a story of responsiveness to mass opinion. 
is the story of the manipulation of mass opinion. He, the other big case that he codes, codes as also responsive are the Bush tax cuts. Uh, and that's one that Jacob and I have actually studied and, and written about. Um, and the reason why Gillens thinks that's responsive to mass opinion was because if you asked people at the time, would you like, do, do you favor the Bush tax cuts? People said yes. Right. So for Gillens, that makes it responsive. But surveys, if you dig a little further into it, you find uh, that if you ask people what they would like to do with the projected surpluses, that is, you don't just set the agenda so that they're only considering tax cuts, you say, how would you like to use that available money? Would you like to reduce the deficit or shore up Social Security and Medicare or spend money on other programs? Right. Tax cuts were actually the lowest priority right, among voters. Right. So that, to me, just like, just like uh, the Iraq War, I think, is an example of the third dimension of power. Uh, the tax cuts are an example of the second dimension of power, but the use of agenda control right, to frame that problem in a particular way and to say yes or no on this proposal, they don't reflect responsiveness to mass opinion. All right. What are the implications uh, to wrap up? Okay. So in principle, I think a policy-focused approach like this is neutral on the question of how power is actually distributed in the society. Right? Doesn't, on its own, it tells you where to look, it doesn't tell you where you'll find. Uh, and as Terry has written in a, in a recent important book, it's possible to think of non-elites consolidating policy regimes uh, that advance their interests. Right? And the example that he points to, um, and I think, I don't agree with everything in that book, um, but um, I think he argues quite convincingly that a set of political victories in many states in the 1950s and 1960s set up a policy regime that was highly favorable to teachers' unions, right? that's been sustained over time. Right? Um, but my view would be, and I assume this is something we're going to talk about more, uh, more tomorrow, that that's not usually going to be the case. Right? Um, that it's usually, that, it, that uh, this kind of world is more likely to benefit um, those who have a lot of political resources right, and are highly organized um, than those who generally are going to be less well endowed with that. Um, as Schatz Snyder, so if you think about health care or finance or energy policy, um, it's not the non-elites who are, who are um, consolidating their influence. Uh, in policy regimes, for the most point, as Schatz Snyder nicely put it a long time ago, uh, the flaw in the, her, in the uh, pluralist heaven uh, is that the chorus sings with an upper-class accent. Um, and the last point that I would say about this is that in a system where, as many scholars have demonstrated, continues to be true, it's very, very hard to change things, right? The system makes it very, very hard to change things. There's a status quo bias. Um, that's not neutral. Um, it's likely, again, I think, to advantage economic elites, to advantage those who benefit from unconstrained markets um, and can exploit what Jacob has called policy drift, right? The idea that sometimes, particularly if you're a nimble private actor with a lot of resources, you can simply outflank some existing policy in order to get what you want, right? The policy's locked in place. It can't be updated because the political system is gridlocked. Uh, and so you get what you want by going around it. And I think there's a lot of reason to believe that the stories of Wall Street and skyrocketing executive pay, which are really the two places that are at the heart of the shifts in income distribution that I talked about earlier, um, that a lot of them have to do with that kind of story. Right? And that, I think, is a good place to come back to at the end, come back to this question of inequality of resources, because for conventional mainstream American politics, meat and potatoes, political science, um, there's a sort of classic analysis about how redistribution ought to work in a democratic society. Right? And it suggests basically that when inequality grows, and especially if the top starts to pull away from the middle, that the median voter ought to benefit from redistribution. And so it ought to be, again, a kind of thermostat. Inequality grows. right? Median voter pushes back, demands more redistribution. 
Now, as Huber and Stevens, North Carolina point out, who have looked at this issue both in the US over time, but also cross-nationally, that sounds logical, that argument for why the median voter ought to push for more redistribution as top-end inequality grows. But empirically, it's just not right, right. Both comparatively and if you look at the US over time, societies that are more equal to begin with, right, redistribute more rather than the other. And as inequality has grown in the United States, um, policy is mostly pushed um, in, the, uh, in the other direction. Why? Huber and Stevens' answer would be consistent with the kind of answer that I've been pushing towards here. A greater distance between the median and the mean income tends to be accompanied by a more skewed distribution of political power and thus lower responsiveness to demands for redistribution. Think of something like the carried interest deduction, right, which is a huge handout to the richest Americans. Right? They're allowed to treat the fees that they get from managing private equity or hedge funds to treat it as capital gains, even though it's not their own capital that's at risk. Right? So it's taxed at 15%. Right? Can't get that issue, even in a Democratic Congress, you, know, you can't get that you can't get that issue um, up for a roll call vote. So I, I want to just close by saying this is really preliminary. Right? I'm really looking forward uh, to tomorrow. I think these issues are very, very thorny to deal with. It's a lot easier to look at what's above the waterline than it is below the waterline. Um, but at a minimum, I want to suggest that political scientists should have some real discomfort about the fact that they can look at American society today and not see a lot of problems associated with massive and rapidly increasing inequalities in what seem like core economic and political resources. Um, and that there's a lot of reason to think that at least part of the problem is that they're looking in the wrong places. Right? That they're looking at open conflict where they need to think about some of the ways in which power actually tends to move into a more submerged place as it becomes more unequal. Right? And they need to spend a little bit less time talking about elections uh, and a little bit more thinking about the kinds of core struggles over public policy uh, and over governance that were at the heart of Aaron Waldowski's political science and, and mine. Thank you. I'm going to start by asking an unfair question, and then, uh, and then I'm going to ask some of the questions that you've written on cards that are all very fair and reasonable. My unfair <laughs> question, which I, which I somehow might think that uh, some people who are not political scientists might ask, uh, somehow I'm imagining an economist asking this question, but I might be wrong, is uh, even if we completely buy your characterization of political science as uh, studying visible things that are not only visible but readily countable, susceptible to the use of the apparatus of, you know, econometrics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even if it's true that political scientists do that and therefore miss the vast bulk of the iceberg that is below the water, uh, so who cares? You know, like, that, that just means that, that means there's a screwed up discipline <laughs> that isn't very, isn't, is not, you know, but like why should the economists in the public policy school who are focused on uh, solving real policy problems be concerned if there's some confused people over in Barrow's Hall? Is that another uh, question? No, I think, I, I, I think it's actually a fair, I think it's a fair question, right? Um, except if you're interested in policy analysis, if you're, if you're interested in policy, you, you need to be interested in politics and understanding politics. I mean, I always say this to my students in public policy classes is that political analysis ought to be a core part of policy analysis, right? There's no point in developing a better mousetrap, right? If there's no way to get that mousetrap, right, you know, actually brought into the world, right? That, and that requires politics. So now the implication may be, well, policy analysts, people in policy schools, economists, they're better off just doing their own off-the-cuff 
political analysis and they are relying on political science, right? Um, but I think the implications of the talk would be the same, right? Whether you, tr whether you, try to, whether you farm it out or try to do it in-house, you'd better think really closely about how influence works, right? Um, and, and recognize not just that you're only observing a small part of it, but, and I think this is a really the crucial, crucial piece of the, of the argument that I'm try trying to develop, right? It's not just that you're only looking at a small piece of it. The piece you're looking at is actually misleading, right? You're not getting a random sample. Right? You're getting, so like, you know, so the Smith study on the Chamber of Commerce, like, that, that I think is a perfect example of it. He has this really, you know, it's very careful work. And he shows that when the, you know, the biggest representative of the business community is really committed to some issue that's on the political agenda, a lot of the time they lose. Much of the time they lose. Maybe even most of the time they lose. Right? Um, but that's not a random sample of issues that the chamber might care about. Right? It's just the ones that somehow, against all odds, are able to get on the political agenda even though, say, they're about so you, need, so you need to really think deeply about influence. If you, care, if you care about actually having the policies happen in the world, then you need to care about politics. Uh, and you need to get questions of influence and how it's distributed and how it changes right. Um, whether, you, whether you find political science helpful for that is another okay. question. There's some questions about elections. Um, so I'll, I'll group them together. Um, one is uh, Downs was in the 1950s, uh, clearly not true now. Um, but was he right for that time? Uh, have circumstances changed, changed, or was Downs naive and wrong in the 1950s? Uh, well, there are a lot of people who don't think that he's clearly wrong now, um, surprisingly, maybe. Um, and, um, you know, so Mo Friarina, great political scientist at Stanford, you know, refers to the, he doesn't use the term the Downsian framework, but that's basically what he's talking about, sort of the master theory of political science over the last half century. And I think that's a fair, that's a fair characterization, at least for the study of American politics. Um, it was probably, it was, I think, almost certainly more true in the 50s um, uh, than, it, than it is today. Um, but I think you could also, uh, I, I think you could also take the kind of argumentation that I'm developing now and suggest that even in the, if you go back to the 50s, if you focus on policy development, right, if you focus on governance rather than the elections that are producing the sort of tweedledee, tweedledum outcome that people talk about in the, in, the, in the 50s, if you looked at policy development, you'd still want to use a lot of the, the kinds of ideas about influence that I was talking about in this paper. So fights over health care reform, for example, in the 1950s. I would argue you can't just do that based on a downscene analysis, right? You need to think about the role of these organized groups and the way in which the politicians are adapting to them and to what they think is possible as a result of the, the power that these groups have, um, not just the electoral venue. There's two other elections questions which I'll just kind of group together. Um, one is, uh, what do, do you think that elections don't matter? Or if they do matter, what role do elections play in your theory? And then I'm going to put that alongside another question that is, under what alternative electoral structure, or is there an alternative electoral structure under which the American dot on the regression line would be, would be on the line instead of so far above it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so well, so the, the, the first thing I, I just I just have to I can't I can't resist mentioning that we're exercise we're we're witnessing power the exercise of power right now because rather than you guys raising your hands, Sean is exercising agenda control right. He's deciding what questions how to how to frame them. I mean I joke to my students about this too right. We, I don't have fights with my students about whether there's going to be a final exam for the course, right? That's and it's not because they might have different interests than I do but it doesn't result in open conflict, right? Because they know that they're gonna lose, right? They know that they're, that, and, and that it would be costly for them to do that, right? So there's, so you, in many settings where you do not see open conflict, there's a lot of power going on, right? So that's, this, this is an example of that. Um, you overestimate me. I'm actually just trying to read your handwriting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's not the first time. Yeah. It's not the first time. Um, uh, so, what were we talking about? 
Um, so uh, I, what I role absolutely, elections play in your theory? I absolutely do not, am not saying that elections don't matter. Right? Elections matter a lot. Right? Elections matter a lot. So if you think about something like the Affordable Care Act, you know, no big Democrat, and this would be true for you know all the major health care reforms, right? That um, you know, same thing for the the enactment of Medicaid and Medicare. Um, uh, no big Democratic victories. No, no health care reform. It's, you know, I think it's, I think it's, that's pretty clear, right? So, so elections matter. Um, it's it's just how much do they matter, right? Um, and what are they able to change, and what are they not able to change? Right? How constrained? How constrained are they? I mean, you could also get into questions about um, what actually generate what actually generates the election outcomes, and to what extent voters are sovereign within that context. Right. Um, but that's not where I was mostly going, going with this talk. Um, the point is that you know, even, and you, the same thing obviously would be true if you look at something like financial reform, right? or climate change. Right? Election outcomes matter, right? um, but, um, but they're only part of a much broader set of fights, um, and the one in which voters are obviously the most prominent. Right? So um, would other electoral systems, you know, would it matter? Yes, you know, I think there's a lot of comparative research again, that, and, and again, it's because I'm not saying that voters don't matter, they do matter, right? Um, but, uh, but a lot of other, a lot, lot of other uh, people, especially um, those who are organized and well-resourced, they matter too. Some things that I think give, give voters more, more impact, more, more leverage, I think, you know, higher turnout um, is, is, is uh, beneficial. I think electoral systems that are more transparent in terms of how they distribute accountability. So parliamentary systems um, where it's clear who's running the government um, and so, um, and who's at least in approximate terms responsible for the outcomes that you're observing, um, that probably helps, helps voters. Um, systems that have uh, fewer veto points probably make it easier for voters to um, to be, uh, be more influential. But on that last point, I mean, I would just, I mean, I think the question of how, I, and I say this in the paper, that I think a really important step in this, trying to work through this analysis, and it's very partial in the paper, is to really think about connecting these arguments about how influence is distributed and what it really looks like um, to an analysis of political institutions. Because the effect of you know, our highly gridlocked and veto-prone and increasingly veto-prone political system, um, on the, it, it clearly has a big impact on a lot of these issues, but I think it's complicated what, exactly what that impact is. A natural follow-up to that as, as a question. Uh, is there any, what, what do you think in terms of campaign spending or finance or co lobbying contribution, reform would be most effective in addressing what concerns you? Like, do you believe there are short-term concrete reforms that would materially respond to what you're concerned about? So, um, so this is a big topic for the conference that's happening at Barrow's. I should, actually, some of it's going to be the same time as our conversation yeah. tomorrow. There's a big conference tomorrow um, at Barrow's on, on um, money and politics. Um, I, um, I think it's very hard to get economic resources out of politics. Um, I think, you know, I think there are some changes that you can make um, at the margins that would probably be helpful. I don't think it's probably great um, that single multi-billionaires can keep a presidential campaign afloat uh, for months at a time. Um, uh, you know, it was in the paper this morning that you know, there are PACs associated with Ted Cruz that have already ponied up $31 million, you know, which will keep him, regardless of his ability to, to um, generate votes, will keep him in the race for a long time. I don't think that's probably actually, I'm not, it's not clear exactly, I don't think the consequences of that are unhealthy. Um, but, I, but I think, you know, to me, I think the, I don't think you're going to get inequalities of economic resources out of politics. I think what you can try to do is encourage countervailing power, right? So I would be, you know, to me it's more about um, trying to expand the political resources of diffuse interests. Partly that means more voting. Right. Um, and, and voting that's more effective in, in producing accountability, um, finding ways to organize relatively diffuse groups in the, in the population. 
Um, but I, I'm not a big believer in the idea that you're going to get money out of politics. Okay. Uh, so for those of you who submitted cards that I didn't ask, ask your question, come please come tomorrow from 9 to 11, and I'm going to ask your question if you show <laughs> up. So you will get an answer to it, I promise. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thanks, John. Okay. Thank you.